we are really going to focus um, our our attention today um, to our good friend Harley. So Harley predates me at the research park, I'm pretty sure, which says something. Um, and uh, as I've been around for quite some time, but uh, Harley has been a part of our entrepreneurship community um, in Champaign-Urbana, although now he is located out of St. Louis um, for quite some time. And he has worked with many teams and is a um, nationally trained i -Corps instructor. And if you don't know what i -Corps is, you're gonna hear that term today and we will define it for you. So don't worry, um, you, you don't need to have that knowledge. But um, Harley is a great resource. He um, is, has seen every side of a company that, that can be from um, leading a company to fundraising and, and uh, to um, investing. So he's seen, seen it all. Um, so I am going to turn it over to you, Harley, to lead us in today's workshop. And, um, you know, we run these things somewhat informally. So if you do have a question, um, we will be monitoring the chat and letting Harley know that there are questions. So we do welcome that and we want this to be a conversation. So Harley, please take it away. Yeah, thanks, Laura. Um, I'm not sure who I, how I feel about being aged to be the uh, predating everyone here. Um, you know, I, I see Alan's on here. So Alan's been hanging around about as long as I have. So I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. And to your point about that, um, you know, some of my experiences, I'm going to start by telling you about how I've screwed up in places that I've screwed up in the past. And because I think that informs why this matters. Um, and this idea of customer discovery or customer-centric design, lean methodology, there's lots of different names for it. Um, in the world of NSF, we use the term i -Corps, um, because that's the NSF-sponsored program. Um, so before I get started, probably the thing I should do is start with an introduction, uh, say, uh, state a little bit about who I am, what I do, um, and the, the way that I'd put it is, uh, a couple credentials that I can, you know, point to. One, as Laura mentioned, I am a national instructor for the National Science Foundation's i -Corps program. I also instruct uh, regional programs and in the program that we conduct at the university through Enterprise Works. Um, so there are opportunities to go through programming that will implement some of the uh, the techniques that I'm going to talk about today and 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 why it matters. Uh, I also do some instruction through the Technology Entrepreneur Center, and then I have a day job, um, which is uh, I, I've operated a med tech venture firm based in St. Louis for the past eight years. Um, with that, we've started eight companies. So all of the methods that I talk about today are things that, um, you know, I eat, I eat my own dog food. We, we practice these things. I currently run one of those companies, which is a medical device for the treatment of heart failure. Um, so I'll get into this and you'll see some of the examples I have here have a, a, a medical bent to them. Um, and in fact, I've already referenced Alan Singleton. He was involved in, in this, this first one, um, uh, well, this case study that I'm going to present. And this is effectively going to tell you what not to do, or at least why this matters. So um, to put a date on this, so that we have a time frame, this was 2003 when this uh, this. Uh, we, we did the funding on this company. It was an early stage round. Um, remarkable technology. And let me get a little bit into the background on the technology because I think the story will, will take shape and hopefully illustrate um, why this matters. So this was a technology that came out of the, uh, the U of I Med Center in Chicago. Uh, it was developed by a neurovascular surgeon who had this problem that when he had patients who had things like aneurysms or strokes, uh, the, the gold standard for imaging was a black and white 2D image that was effectively looking at the outside of the plumbing and saying, what do we do? Is blood flowing through there? Is it blocked? Uh, is that vessel, does it uh, run the risk of bursting? Things like that. It's like inviting a plumber to your house and saying, where's the clog in my pipes by looking at the outside of the pipes. This individual had developed a technology that could look at any vein and, or any, uh, you know, any vessel in the body 
and the example shown here is uh, the vasculature within the head. And you take a cross section and then the, those kind of blue um, color spots on the right hand side of the screen, you have a cross sectional image. So you could actually see the blood that's flowing inside that person's, inside that specific vessel um, and understand if there was a risk of, uh, you know, if there was an, an occlusion or if you needed to operate or needed to do something. And this was done using an MRI. So there, there was, it was totally non-invasive, which was remarkable because up until that point, the only way to do this was to implant a catheterized probe and snake it from the, uh, from the carotid artery up the neck and inside somebody's head in order to understand uh, what the flow was. So this was game-changing technology to this day, you know, almost 20 years later, it's still remarkable technology and I'll, I'll stand behind that. Here's the thing. In my process, we interviewed 36 neurovascular surgeons to understand or try to understand what does this technology mean to you? How do you currently go about this? And one by one, they showed me, and even in the backdrop of this image, it's a, a bunch of screens of angiography, these black and white 2D images. And 36 out of 36 neurovascular surgeons interviewed said that this technology is a game changer. This will absolutely uh, change the way that I practice medicine. Uh, these are some of the quotes. I still have my notebook with all of these uh, interviews. You know, in a perfect world, I'd be able to see what's happening inside the arteries. This will change the way I practice medicine today. And I even had one individual who said, I will order this test on every single one of my patients. So this is pretty strong evidence, right? I mean, we, we knew, okay, we, we've got a winner here. The, the users, those physicians are telling us that they are going to order this test. So we were ready to go. So put together a funding round. We did the first portion of what turned into, it was, uh, it was actually about a $4.75 million Series A. We'll, we'll round up, call it a $5 million Series A, which ultimately led to our 510K clearance. The company had its clearance ready to go, right? So we start, I had a list of 36 users. I know exactly who my customers are. I'm going to go talk to them. And one by one, 36 neurovascular surgeons told us, well, I can't buy this. I said, I said I'd order the test, not that I would buy the software and install it. I said, you need to talk to radiology. They're the ones who own the magnets that this runs on. So I said, okay, no problem. Can you make an introduction? Tell me, you know, who is radiology? Who do we talk to? So we finally get on their meetings, uh, you know, get on the books. And then this process takes some months. We talk to these radiologists. Remember, these are physicians, the whole, uh, you know, uh, first do no harm. Come in, pitching our story about how the clinical benefit, this is going to change the way neurovascular surgeons practice medicine. And in all of those interviews, I think you can probably guess how many clinical questions radiologists, Hippocratic Oath, um, you know, clinicians asked us. And that answer is zero. They wanted to know two things, and very clearly. They said, how long does this take? And the, the reason they wanted to know is to do a head and neck scan took them 48 minutes, and they scheduled their magnets on one hour blocks. And they needed to know that we would fit within that 12 minutes with a little bit of a, a, a barrier, a cushion there on either side so that um, in the event it took a little longer to get a patient set up, they could still stick to their once on the hour, top of the hour schedule in scheduling the magnets. They weren't going to deviate from that. That's how everything was set up and every test was designed to run within an hour. Well, they needed 48 minutes and this technology took 16 minutes. So right there, they said, we won't install this. Next question, what's my reimbursement rate? Which basically what they wanted to know is how much do I get paid for running this test? Pretty simple thing, right? So these radiologists who are clinicians, trained medical doctors who are supposed to uh, do what's best for the patient wanted to know that they're not gonna disrupt their schedule and that they wanna know how much money they're making for doing this thing. So all of a sudden it's like, huh, this is interesting. We got some work to do, um, but here's the sad part. The technology, we actually had to dumb it down in order to make it fit that 16 minute test fit into that 12 minute window. We actually had to go back to the engineers 
and say, hey, by the way, we need this to do less than it currently does. We need less quality on the image. We need fewer images. We need it to work faster. And we knew we had 12 minutes, so we told them, cut it in half. Take it from 16 to eight, so we know we've got the cushion. So they effectively had to make the technology half as good as what it was in order for it to be adopted and used in a, in a clinical setting. Fast forward, all of these things take time. This results in a down round. Down round in the startup world is not a good thing. It means when you go raise more money on top of the money you've already raised and the valuation goes down, it means that everybody gets compressed, ratchets get pulled, um, you know, which uh, makes the, the people, the prior share, uh, shareholders not very happy. Uh, people lose their jobs, plain and simple. Is the, there's not enough money, so you have to, uh, in this case, all of our uh, commercial activities were slashed, um, and engineering was cut to just those engineers who could get this thing ready to sell. Anyway, months go by, and just to put this in perspective, when I say months, you know, we're now probably a year, year and a half into this. We've actually had to go back twice for additional capital at this point. Anyway, we finally get in front of hospital administration. And all of a sudden we're hearing about HIPAA and EULAs and uh, HERP and DRGs and HCE and you know all this this alphabet soup. Um, you know, a EULA, this was software based. Did you know they, they actually had some attorney somewhere read the user license agreement. I, I don't know anybody ever read them. They did, uh, told us we had to change some things in, in the way that it operated in order to make sure that they were HIPAA compliant, which is patient privacy. Um, they were concerned about their reimbursement rates and their readmission rates and the penalties that were coming. They wanted to know the economics on it. Anyway, fast forward, this takes, again, months. It's a months long process. And they finally say, okay, you're good. You're clear to go. You can go talk to purchasing. So I end up in the basement of uh, North Shore Community Hospital with the, you know, the, the purchasing agent who works in a windowless fluorescent lit room. And effectively, the purchasing agent looks at me and said, okay, you know, I, I understand that administration signed off and you're interested in, uh, in, in a sale and, and, you know, tell me what the terms are. And we laid out the install cost in the first year. It was effectively $100,000 for the first year with a three-year contract. And, and he effectively laughed at me. Um, and he said, you know, that, that's, a, that's a capital expenditure. Um, you know, or he said, that's CapEx, not OpEx. And, and, you know, at this point I said, what does that mean? He said, well, uh, you know, I can only buy things that are less than $25,000. He said, you're $100,000, you've got to get on the CapEx budget committee. And this was May, a few years later. And I said, okay, how do I do that? When does that happen? He said, well, for next year, they'll meet in November. And, you know, it was at about that time, I think I was about to cry. I might have shed a few tears in his office. And he, uh, he took a little pity on me and he said, well, hang on just a sec. Let's figure out what we can do. He said, you know, how much is, as we went through, he said, can you get this for, can you sell it for less than $5,000 a month? I said, I don't think so, but what do you mean? And he said, well, if it's under operating expenditure, we can discretionarily buy technology that's less than $5,000 a month. He said, so if you can get under 5,000 a month, I can, I can buy. Anyway, fast forward, I said, okay, I can do under 5,000 a month. I'm like, that's $60,000. If you give me a three-year contract, again, he laughed. He said, I can give you a one-year contract. Um, you know, our install cost was basically the, the value of that contract, but we got our first sale three and a half years later, two rounds of funding later, six jobs lost um, for a one-year contract for less than 60% of the original one-year value of the contract. And, and we happily took that sale. Now, here's the thing. Right? I've told you this long story. You're kind of saying, okay, what, what does this mean? Why does it matter? This was my hard lesson learned, is that every single answer that I needed to know prior to this happening existed before we closed that first funding round. If I had known, I, I got content, I was smug, I heard 36 clinicians all tell me yes, so that was pretty resounding. I was ready to go, I thought, this is gonna work. And so I got confident in that. In fact, not just myself, all of us did. 
we started, uh, you know, believing our own hubris is maybe the way I'd put it. We didn't think to get past the physician who orders the test to understand what their ecosystem looks like, who is actually responsible for buying this, who's actually responsible for paying for it. What does it take in order for them to order the test and what does that mean long term? And if we had taken the time to ask the questions and understand what their ecosystem looked like, who all the players were, what they cared about and what it would take to get everybody working in alignment in order to adopt this technology, we could have probably gotten every single one of those answers in four to six weeks without ever raising that first dime and without ever leading into this three and a half year painful path, um, which ended up turning into a much longer, more painful path, um, you know, before we, we finally exited the company um, for less than the total paid in capital. So again, this is, uh, you know, I, I'd love to say that I'm, I'm sharing all these great stories about places where we've done well, but the reality is the hardest lessons learned are the ones that stick with you. And as I walked away from this, realized that there has got to be a better way. There's got to be a way of understanding this and making sure that we set up a, a company that's, that's prepared to succeed. And this is something that also over the years that I've learned is that startups, especially I'm talking about tech startups here, right? The people on the call are at Enterprise Works, you're in a technology incubator. They, they start, they, or they fail because of a lack of customers, not from product development. And really what we're saying here is that engineers do a really good job of completing exactly what they say they're going to complete. They, they're very adept at that. And, and so, you know, I can kind of point to a favorite. Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with Guy Kawasaki. He was one of the early Mac designers and um, became a, a very uh, early, well-known venture capitalist in, the, in Silicon Valley. Had this book, Art of the Start. He's got a method for startup valuation. And that's effectively, he says, every engineer that's part of the core team, you add a half a million dollars to the startup value. And for every MBA, subtract a quarter million. By the time you put that all together, you'll have an idea of what your startup's worth. And I, this is tongue in cheek, but effectively it's saying that last statement that engineers get the job done. They are, when engineers say they can do something, they historically manage to deliver on that. Whereas when you look at the sales side of the equation, that's where we tend to fall short. And the reason that we do is we often fail to understand exactly what people want, what people want to buy. And so we, we used to subscribe to this, okay, go do our market research, build it, and they'll come. But effectively, with lean methodology, what we're saying is this doesn't work anymore. We don't buy this methodology. And so what we do subscribe to is this customer discovery method. Um, you know, we'll refer to it as i or the i methodology. And if I had to sum it up in a single sentence, it's actually a question. It's, it's just what's here on the screen. Who better to tell you what to build than the individuals that you want to pay for it. And, and, and so you need to take the time to do primary market research, go get face to face with those individuals and understand what they want to see. And really the point here is to avoid building that something, something that nobody cares about, but instead find something they do. So in the case, the example I just gave you, this technology, this is neurovascular surgeons wanted it. But the reality is, in order for this to be adopted commercially, there were a whole lot of things that had nothing to do with the technology. They were all business issues that we actually overbuilt the technology on day one and had to go back and change the technology in order to meet the business needs. And that's the real lesson here is how do you understand what to build? So when we look at these traditional approaches that tend to focus on reducing risk or risk mitigation. It's reducing tech risk or execution risk. And I'm not saying those are unimportant. We're just saying you're not there yet. If you're an early stage business and you've got an idea or you're doing early stage development, we're not at the point that we need to figure those things out yet. We first need to figure out what the heck people want. So we can look at these three questions that any new technology innovation needs to answer. Just first is what value are you delivering and to whom? And I'm going to come back to this in a second. Next is, is there a viable business model for delivering that value? 
And then last is this idea of, okay, what's the ROI? If I build this, am I gonna make enough money doing this? Are there enough people who care to say that this is worth my time? And when we look at these traditional approaches that are working on technology mitigation, um, you know, or mitigating uh, market risk, they are assuming, they're starting here with this third question. They're assuming the first two questions have already been answered. And they're taking what we call the, the build, show, and hope approach, or you, know, you could call it a hope and pray approach. We don't want to do this. Here's what we do know, is that if you understand these three questions in this order, meaning we're starting with this idea of what value and to whom, or who cares and why is another way of saying that. Um, when you get there, we call that product market fit. That, that is our single greatest indicator of startup success, is if you can bridge that gap. If you can bring the thing that somebody cares about to them, they're more likely to buy. Think about all the first-gen products that you bought or things that, that maybe weren't the best or most elegant solution, but they got the single job done that you cared about most, so you adopted or bought the lesser solution. I, I know we've all done this. That's because you really care about one thing and that it gets that one thing done. You can think about anything you buy. So um, think about the last time you made a significant voluntary purchase, um, you know, more than a hundred bucks. You probably considered more than one option. And when you considered or weighed those two, there was probably one maybe two reasons, but usually there's one thing that stands out, which is the reason why you choose the one specific um, option that you chose. So this is what we need to do. We need to start with this idea of what do people really care about and who is that group of people that care about that one thing. And this method is what we call our build, measure, and learn. This is the lean methodology, which is use direct interaction or primary market research to understand it. So when we do this, our tool, our primary tool for product market research is this box. It's called the business model canvas. And it's a, uh, an arrangement of nine boxes. Each means a different thing. And I'll, I'll really quickly, just very quickly introduce them to you. But we kind of break this thing up into, um, into blocks. Even though there's nine blocks, we, we, we further break it down. But this top right, section of the canvas. VP is value proposition, CS is customer segment. And the relationships and channels are the way that you deliver value to those customers. This is that marriage between who cares and why. This is that single thing that we start with. And what we how we think about this is, is your solution desirable? If you don't have something that's desirable, I don't care how great your business model is, how great a plan you've got, how great a team you've got. If nobody cares, your chances of success are very slim. However, think of it the other way. If you know you've got something that's desirable that people care about, you can really have a lot of leeway to screw up or get the other things wrong and still have customers that are gonna be forgiving or tolerant or deal with a finicky early version of the product because it, it's something they want. It gets that job done, it solves the problem that they need solved or gives them that uh, emotional gain that they need that they're willing to invest in that in spite of some of the other things. So you've got a lot more leeway to get the other things right later so long as you truly know who cares and why. So this is exactly where we start is with this idea of desirability. So now we look at the left-hand side. And the left-hand side is all of the things that you need to do in order to deliver on this product. So these are the key activities that you need to do, the key resources that you need to do it, the, the key partners that you might need. So if you're a tech business, your key activity might be early stage R&D. If you're R&D, the key resources you need to do that, you need people. You need the people who are able to execute on that R&D program. You need to invest in probably an intellectual property to protect what those people build. Perhaps you need to license somebody else's intellectual property. That might be a key partner. So these are the things that you need to do. 
And all of this has to do with feasibility. So on the right hand side is desirability. The left hand side is feasibility. Can you do the things that are necessary to deliver value to that customer? So now we'll look down to the bottom because the bottom is where the rubber meets the road. This is the economics here. And if you look at that idea of desirability, if you have something that somebody wants, hopefully you get to ring your cash register. That means you've got revenues. All of those things you need to do to deliver it, those activities, those resources, those partnerships, usually those cost money. Those have expenses tied to them. So that's your cost structure. And what we're really looking for here is to make sure that your revenue streams are significantly bigger than your cost structure. And if you do this, you've got a business that's viable. And so when I, I'll pause for a second to talk about i and what we do with i core i -Corps is effectively, we, we sit down and fill out a canvas. The canvas is your best guess, their hypotheses. And then what we do is we go talk to customers in order to validate or invalidate those hypotheses and understand whether or not you have a complete business model that will work. And the way that we structure it, i -Corps actually has several steps to it. So the program that we run at, through Research Park is really focused on the top right hand side, this idea of desirability. It's really introducing the process and making sure you understand who cares and why. Then there's a national program, which is a grant based program where you get money in order to go work on your startup. Non dilutive capital, it's a great deal. That looks at the, the whole picture. That is, do you have a business model that fits? And if you come out the back end of that, you will likely have a position that you can articulate to either investors or uh, granting agencies that you have a business that's designed for commercial success. And, and that's the way we do it. It's really quite simple. Um, it's just tedious. It requires discipline. It requires your constant work to go talk to people to make sure you understand what they care about. And ultimately, what we want to know is that you're solving a problem that's big enough that somebody's willing to pay for it. So this idea that how often have you had somebody say, oh yeah, that's nice, that'd be pretty cool. But people don't buy because of it's, it's nice or it's pretty cool. What they want is the gotta have it factor. And so what we're looking for is that gotta have it. What's the thing that you can do that people care so desperately about that they're, actu they're actively looking to solve that problem. They're not waiting for you to show up on their doorstep and knock on their door and say, hey, I'm a salesperson, I'm, I'm making a sales call. Instead, it's the problem that they're actively looking to solve and you want to, to address that issue. Okay, so your technology and all of this, right? I, I, I'm supposing at Research Park, we have a lot of tech emphasis, a lot of engineers, and the reality is nobody cares about your technology. What they do care about is what it can do for them. So the whole point here is we leave your technology out of the process. This process of lean methodology has nothing to do with your technology. Instead, it's a business program where you are talking about their business problems and their business needs. And that's the way we do it. And ultimately, what we're trying to do is save ourselves up to months, if not years of time. We want to get to these answers in weeks of time as opposed to months or years. And so coming right back to that initial story that I told you, the case study with Vassal, that's the example where I did something that cost me three and a half years, significant capital, family money, as well as money from co-investors who were people that, um, you know, respected business acquaintances. Um, it cost me political capital, uh, trust with people that, you know, those investors who invested in me then, it became a little harder to ask for them for, for money the next time. And I could have had all of those answers in weeks. So I'm gonna pause for just a second here. I'm gonna see if there are questions related to what the, the lean methodology is and how it's done. And then after that, I'm gonna shift gears and we'll talk about how COVID has changed the process and you know, go through a few tips. So I know looking at the participant list, there's a handful of you who have already been through our site program. There's some that have, uh, have applied for our upcoming site programs this fall. Um, and so for those of you that maybe have some experience, I want to share some of the things that we're seeing, best practices we're seeing both locally and at the national level uh, moving forward. But I'll stop for a second and see if there's questions on 
why we do what we do. Cool. Well, I'll, I'll move on and I'll make sure that I leave some time again at the end. So in, in case we want to get to it. So, you know, look, everything's changed and we all know that. And the beauty of the, this i -Corps methodology is that this is a human program. As I mentioned, this is not about your technology. This is about interacting with human beings and understanding what people want. So we've, uh, we've been fortunate that um, NSF has continued to stick with the program. In fact, in the, uh, in the spring, we were midstream in the, um, the national boot camp programs for the SBIR companies. Uh, and, and just changed midstream from in-person delivery to remote. And ever since it's been that way, uh, managed to roll out all of the initial summer cohorts. Uh, the final summer cohorts are finishing now. And then, well, we, we finished the spring cohorts all the summer and continuing into the fall. And for the foreseeable future, NSF will be running the i -Corps program remotely. And so we've had just enough time at this point that there's been, um, you know, in, enough cohorts that we've kind of, as instructors, come back together and said, okay, what's working, what's not, what's, you know, some of this is obvious, some is less so. Um, but what I want to walk through is this idea that, you know, we predicate customer discovery based on getting in front of your customers in order to understand their problem. So customer discovery is a primary market research program. So primary is things that you learn from direct interaction with your customers that are directly applicable to you and your business. Whereas secondary market research is things that are generic that pre-exist. So a report that you, that you purchase, um, a business report or something you read in the Wall Street Journal, that's secondary market research or your trade organizations. So this is really predicated upon primary market research. And obviously there's some things that have changed. The one thing that has always been true, when we think about a gold standard interview, it's you're catching the person in their work environment so you can see what they deal with. You can see what their day looks like, how they interact with technology, how the problems that they address come up. And so, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the proxy for this is we talk about being able to see their pupils dilate. If you see somebody's pupils dilate, you know they're excited, you know they're engaged. And excitement doesn't just mean good, it could be bad also, right? And, and by bad, I mean, you might see a customer get angry and that's a good thing because you know that's something they care about. You know it's a problem that frustrates them. So this ability to see somebody face-to-face -face in their working environment, we use, you know, pupils dilating or at least being able to see that level of, of emotion as a good signal that you're getting good feedback. The other thing is the other signal. They're not checking their watch. So when you're face to face with somebody, you know, we say checking their watch, maybe the, 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 the more contemporary term would be they're not checking their phone. If they're constantly reaching into their pocket, pulling out their phone or looking at their phone, um, hoping that, uh, that somebody's gonna text them any minute or call them so that they can cut out, you know they're disengaged. They're not interested in what you have to say. They're not interested in sharing what they have. And so this becomes the gold standard. This is what we're looking for, is the ability to engage with a human being on a human level. So you may think you sell a technology to a tier one autom automotive supplier. The fact of the matter is there's a human being who works for that tier one automotive supplier with a very specific design, defined role, whose job it is to address this issue. And that's the individual that you need to reach. So again, breaking it down to the human level. So how do we do it now? Well, it's exactly what we're doing right now. We video conference. So as I've been talking, you've probably been able to see my emotion. You've been able, been able to see when my hands get involved with my talking, you know, am I somebody that talks with my hands? Do I show more animation? When I'm doing that, you know I'm engaged. If all of a sudden this happens and you just get my static picture, you know that I'm probably checking my email when uh, you come back and, oh, sorry, you know, you just caught me, right? So using video conferencing, can be a good substitute and it can be an effective substitute for this process. But the key is that you need to be able 
to observe facial expressions so that you can tell if somebody is engaged or not. Now, here's the thing. With video conferencing, if you had asked me a year ago, can we have a video conference? You know, if you had asked me for time and, and asked to set up a call and then said, I'll send you, a, I'll, I'll Skype you at this time. My answer would have been, don't Skype me, call me. Skyping is a pain in the butt. I don't know where I'm going to be. I don't know if I'm going to have bandwidth. I, I don't know what my connection is going to be. Um, and plus, I, I don't know what I'm going to be wearing. And if I'm in a place that, you know, I want you to see, or maybe uh, I'm going to take that call from uh, baseball practice, my kid's baseball practice, which is something that happens quite frequently for me, especially this time of year. Um, now, post-COVID, everybody's used to this medium. Everybody quickly got used to working through Zoom or Teams or uh, you know, even Skype or, or Hangouts, whatever their favorite or whatever their company is doing, people are used to it. So when you ask somebody or just send them an invite that includes a, a Zoom link, they tend to actively just go right to it. They don't even question it. People are more receptive to video conferencing, so they, they don't question it. The other thing, people are more accessible. So I'm doing a lot of work with strategic partners. I am frequently calling both strategic partners and venture investors. Used to be you'd call their office. Well, there was a gatekeeper at the office whose job was to screen the call and make sure that you didn't get through unsolicited. You only got through if you were scheduled. Well, now that people are at home, a lot of these systems aren't there. The, the gatekeepers aren't always there. People tend to be more accessible. They either answer their own uh, answer their own phones um, and you might be able to reach them. The other thing is people have more time. I, I sat down at one point and added up because I, I live in St. Louis, um, part-time in Colorado. The company that I'm currently running, my whole team's in Minneapolis and I'm typically in Champaign at least one day a week. And so when I added that up, I averaged, I figured that I was averaging at least 12 hours a week of travel time, whether I was in a car or on an airplane, at least that much travel time, that all of a sudden I recaptured that. Now I'm not working any less, but now all of a sudden that's a significant amount of time that I have available elsewhere. Well, if I have that, lots of other people have that same time, especially evenings, since a lot of our social activities have disappeared. I'm not opposed to having a call in the evening or on the weekends because I'm not as busy as I used to be. I don't have those baseball practices to go to anymore uh, because that's all shut down. So all of a sudden people are not only more receptive, they're more accessible and have more time. It all adds up to, we are seeing people get a lot. They're getting a hold of much more quickly. A lot of the people that they want to talk to. All right, this is the obvious one. And I'm actually gonna go to the video. I'm gonna see if people are on video because I wanna see it. Looks like most people have turned off their video. In fact, it looks like everyone, but for those that are on video, is anybody willing to stand up right now? <laughs> uh, 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 I see Alex has shorts on. Ellen's unwilling. I see Sherry. We, I, tough to see. Right? We're all doing this, right? I, I, I do have pants on. I but... do it myself. This is my uniform these days, right? My, my uniform is if I'm on Zoom, my pants are off. <laughs> I, I, that is just how it is, right? Uh, you know, we are, I took time to put on a business shirt. I comb my hair. I, I even tried to think about my COVID beard and, and how I look, you know, make sure that I look quasi presentable, maybe not perfect, but good enough, right? But I'm not putting on pants. It's been incredibly hot here. It's humid. We've had terrible rainstorms the past week. Um, and so it's very uncomfortable around here, uh, temperature wise. So you bet I'm sitting in my shorts. And 
most everybody else's too, right? We're human beings and that's what it comes down to. So, you know, when you think about this, if we don't have to get dressed up, if we don't have to commute to an office, it's a lot easier to squeeze in that 10, 15 minute call. And I can do that between, you know, getting coffee and reading my first emails of the day. If you call me and ask for that time, I'll probably find that time. So will a lot of other people. Now here's the downside. You know, we talked about the best interviews being the ones where you're in person, you get to see them in their environment. You see the chain of events. Why is this a problem and what are the consequences and what happens if you don't solve this problem? Who else is affected? What's the timing? What's the cost? How, how, what is that cost in terms of both, uh, you know, person hours as well as dollars? And if the person in station one doesn't get their job done, what does that mean for the person in station two? Are they waiting on them? Is there a bottleneck? It's that type of thing. This is lost. This is tough. This is the one thing that we have to understand. We can't make it up in terms of being there and getting the answers that they don't talk about. But what you can do is become a master at getting other people to tell stories. And this is your job is to get people to tell stories and walk you through these things. And I'll talk about this in, in a minute when I talk to you know another slide. Here's another thing. Virtual conferences are all over the place these days. Uh, it, you know, if anybody wants to give me their, uh, their industry or, the, or their, their category, within about 10 minutes of Googling, I can probably have at least two events for you to attend this week. I don't care what field you're in. People have realized that this is a necessity. And this is something that I don't think is gonna change. I think this is here to stay, that we're gonna have a lot more of this type of thing and a lot less of the go in person. Those, those big conferences are still going to be necessary and still going to be important when, when we do have large conferences in person again. But I think we're going to have a lot more of these quick, you know, short uh, duration, quick touches. And there's just a handful, you know, listed out here, right? 10 times, Bizabo, Meetup, Eventbrite, uh, go, to your, go to your trade conferences and see what they're doing. They're all hosting webinars, conferences, lunch and learns, things like this. It's worth scheduling or planning out to say, hey, I'm going to put an hour a week into this type of thing. And then the networking matters. You know, it's, it's like the, the old saying, when's the best time to plant an oak tree? 50 years ago. When's the second best time? Today. Well, with networking, it's the same way. The networking doesn't matter. You, you, need, it, you need, it, need it to be done by the time you need it. So, just put the time into networking to make sure you know people in your industry. Now, here's another thing. When you do get in touch with somebody, the first, you know, we already talked about, you know, none of us are wearing pants, but the next is be a human. Acknowledge what's going on. You know, that, that it doesn't mean we're all in this together, right? We've all heard the, the, the taglines, right? You know, we're all in this together. Thank, thanks, American Airlines, you know. Where, where were you? We weren't in it together at uh, Christmas when my bag weighed 52 pounds and you made me take two pounds out and carry it on, right? But now all of a sudden we're in it together when, uh, when you want me to fly again, right? We don't need to be trite, but we can just be human, which is, look, hey, how are you doing? You know, is, is, do you still have job security? How's your family? Are people healthy? These are the types of things that humanize this and get people talking. How have things changed? Do you care about the same things anymore? You know, the things that you thought of as big problems at work, are they still big problems? I'm working on this space. I want to know if they still care about that. Is that still really a problem to them? Or have they moved on? I'm in the medical field. I'm working in cardio. Cardio events are down right now. Or people saying that, yeah, you know, we're less concerned about cardio right now. We're really concerned about front lines. And then this question is a human, you know, like, right. There is some expectation that we are going to return to something that resembled what we were previously doing, but what are they expecting? What do they expect to be the same? What do they expect to be different? These are good ways to get people talking. But once you get them talking as an individual, you've also got to address the other, which is the business needs. This is why we're doing it, you know, when, when we're asking about the business. 
Is COVID affecting sales? If it is, what does that mean for their budgets? Do they still have the ability to adopt new things? Are they doubling down on technology, on ways that they think they can be more efficient? Or have they cut deals? Um, I will tell you, I was in the middle of a Series A fundraising this spring. I have one strategic partner and two venture investors. It was Series A, so it was first money in for the venture investors. Term sheet signed, late stage of due diligence, and both of the venture investors said, our limited partner said no new placements, not until at least Q3, and that's when we'll even begin to reevaluate. Deal was pulled out from, you know, rug was pulled out from under. Venture capitalists just said, it's not that we don't want to do this deal. It's just that's, that's our current obligation. And so all of a sudden that explains it. My conversation with the strategic was quite different. They said, yeah, our sales are off, but our budgets are already set. And, you know, we're not spending on M&A right now. We're actually doubling down on venture investment. So all of a sudden we have other opportunities. You might want to understand, are there regulatory changes? Are there things that, that uh, allow, you know, like uh, in, in FDA re regulated space, all, everybody was all of a sudden saying, well, are there emergency use applications that we can file under with for technology related to treatment of COVID? And then understanding what's temporary, what's going to be long term. And then once again, right, you know, we ended the personal questions with what do you expect when you return? Well, the same thing with the business. What do you expect when you return? These are really great questions that can get you going. And, and again, get somebody talking where 10 minutes turns into more. So now, and I, I almost wrapped with some of this, but the, I, I mentioned earlier, you know, since you can't be there in person and see what happens, now the key is you need to get them to tell you. Have you ever asked an engineer to tell a story? I, I, I try and do this with my engineering staff all the time, and it's painful. But what you need to do is guide them. Ask them, tell me about what led to this. What led to this being a problem? Why is it a problem? Who was dealing with it? Can you share an example of where not solving this problem led to a negative consequence? How often does that happen? Is that common or is that uncommon? If it's common, who's involved in the solution? What solutions are being used? Are you cobbling together something or do you have other, other solutions that might be a competing solution to what you've got? What's the cost in that? What's the time involved? Stick to this idea of tell me a story, right? You don't have to be great at this in order to get somebody else to be a great storyteller. You just need to ask questions that are not these closed yes or no questions, but instead questions that say, tell me about, give me an example. Can you tell me how you currently solve that problem? That's no longer even a question, right? That's even, it, it's a statement. It is tell me. And when you get people doing that, it's remarkable how people will open up. And all of a sudden, when you've asked them for 10 minutes, you're going to look at your clock an hour later and you're going to be wondering if you should be stopping them from talking because that's when you know you've got that engagement. You're going to see the pupils dilate. You're going to see that they're not looking at their watch or looking at their phone or looking at their screen. They're engaged with where you go. So this becomes the key is this idea of there's an even stronger emphasis on asking questions that force people to tell stories. Now here's the last, and maybe this is obvious, but you are deeply engaged in your project and you care deeply about what you're doing, as you should, we all do. But you've also got to be aware that things aren't normal right now. There's some customer discovery that just can't be done. No, you can't go do a field visit. They're not even allowed to go in their office in some cases. So if that's the case, you're not going to see their work environment. You're not going to see their plant. You can't go into their labs. That just is an impossibility. So you have to accept that. Also, frontline workers, they're preoccupied. They've got bigger things that are more pressing that they have to deal with and that their health is at stake. Also, you know, I picked a, a travel and hospitality industry. They're not the only ones, but there's other industries. They're just concerned about keeping their dang jobs. They don't care about what you're working on. And the problem that they, that you think you're solving 
about, you know, um, getting the, uh, uh, you know, more um, solving food waste in the restaurant industry. Um, you know, they just want orders to come in the door and they want to be able to process those orders and get those out so that they can keep their job because they, you know, they used to be a server and now they're somebody that's taking orders and packaging food. And, and, and so, you know, be sensitive, right? That's a, a that's a, not a likely case with technology businesses, but I'm using it as, as an example. Understand what people are facing and try and understand what the stressors are that they're facing. If all of a sudden they're no longer concerned with solving that problem, don't head that direction. You, you just have to back that one off and maybe it's not the right time for your business or maybe there are other things that you can be doing within your business right now. And then last, you know, this idea is is your solution relevant to the struggle at hand? So what I'm saying is only double down or press. So if, if you're talking about frontline workers in the healthcare space, maybe you've got a COVID solution. If that's the case, then, then that's where you can use judiciousness to say, okay, maybe there are still ways that I can advance this program and I need to do that. And, and that's where, again, this becomes that human element and you have to understand when people are okay with it and when you need to back off. So make sure you're listening, which is the key element of, of this whole lean process where we say, you know, you've got two ears and one mouth, try and use them in that same proportion. And then ultimately, when we look at customer discovery, it's not your job to go show off your technology and see what people say, if they like it or not. It's your job to go understand what the problem is and for you to derive the insight whether your technology can solve that problem and you can deliver that in a business fashion or a business sense uh, that, that solves that problem. So, and that remains up to you. That is unchanged and will forever be true. And, uh, and, and ultimately that's what this process is all about, right? So um, looking, I, I think we've got about five minutes and um, you know, wanted to make sure that we have an opportunity for q and I, I see a couple were posted to chat. Um, yeah, so Ella has a question about um, future cohorts. So good news is that we are ramping up all of our um, virtual cohorts for the fall. We have dates on the calendar to start uh, September 2nd, and then we're going to do one, I believe it's October 2nd. So we've got at least two coming up, and it appears that we might have need for another one even moving forward. So there will be cohorts. In fact, part of the reason that we, uh, um, that we scheduled this program today was that we have, uh, you know, it was to make sure that people are aware of what the program is, why it matters, how to go about it, so that people can apply, those that are interested can apply for these fall cohorts. So, um, and Alex has confirmed in the, uh, in the chat that I had the dates correct. So um, even though the website still says cohorts were suspended, that was actually the in-person element that got suspended in the spring because we can't travel. Um, but uh, um, the, the cohorts will be launching and we're, we're excited to see it. And Ella, yes, I, I have seen your application. So we're, we'll be excited to have you this fall. Um, I'm gonna go back because Indu had asked a question about the Guy Kawasaki method of valuing a business. And, uh, and, and I'm sure you're asking this because you're pursuing your, your MBA uh, right now and I'm, and I'm not trying to devalue that. It's a tongue in cheek, it's intended to be a little bit of a joke, um, but it's to say that in technology startup land, engineers do a really good job of achieving milestones and hitting targets. And you know, we use the MBA as a, a proxy for a salesperson, um, somebody that's gonna go uh, talk and, and share a lot of hubris um, and sometimes maybe uh, overstate the truth is maybe the way that I'd put it or overstate what the technology is capable of. And so when we think about the sales process, um, you know, that's where we fall short is the, uh, the, the customer adoption, not the, the technical solution. You know, oftentimes like in this case, I, the, the Vassal case I used, right? The engineers achieved everything they set out to do. They, uh, um, they completed their, their tasks and did it on time under budget and it turned out that the customers didn't care about what they solved. So that's the, uh, that, that was the message there. 
let's see. Uh, let me see. Sam had asked, have I attended virtual conferences? Yes, I've attended virtual conferences. Um, and like any, even like an in-person conference, the key is to curate your time there in advance um, and understand who's going to be there and who you want to see. So what I have seen is a lot have not just had open networking because they know it's hard to kind of dump a bunch of people into a Zoom room, but instead you have the ability to complete a profile in advance and then you can search through those in advance and make sure you understand who will be there. And that's where I have personally had the most success. And I've heard about uh, i -Corps teams having a great amount of success is when they go in knowing exactly who they want to talk to and they use that networking event as that opportunity to get to that person as opposed to just cold calling them or, or sending a cold email. Let's see, I'm sorry, losing this. Um, let's see. Do you recommend pitching an idea to the target customer before or after a prototype is complete? So this is from David. Um, so David, this is a tough one, right? The i method is based on, we want to understand the problem before the solution. I will tell you there comes a time when you know, you're, you know that you've identified product market fit, meaning you know who the customer segment is and what they care about. And that in an interview, I will tell them, hey, we're working on something that I think solves this issue. Would it be okay if I came back to you when we have something to show you? And even though I might have that MVP ready, I'll ask to separate that. The, the key here is don't introduce your technology in that discovery meeting, because the moment you do, the rest of the conversation is only about your technology. And it's not really about if that's the solution they would have chosen, or if that's the thing they actually care about. So that's why we try and keep your solution out. And I'll even tell you, I, I have meetings where somebody will say, hey, I know you're working on, or what, tell me what you're working on. And what I ask them, I, I'm explicit about it. I say, listen, I, 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 I'm happy to share that information if possible. Can I leave that to the end of the, the meeting so that I can get your unbiased feedback before we, we address that topic? So those are a couple um, strategies. Let's see. Let's see. Rio asked, uh, during the first 10 minutes with people, there's two types. Those who are willing to engage and, uh, and those who want to be straight to the point um, and having the free flowing conversation. So, you know, th this is, you're right. Um, I, I will tell you that when I go into a conversation, my method is I put the one question that I'm trying to get answered by that person on the top of my notepad. And I start with a personal question in order to try and get them warmed up. I don't go right to that question. I, I, I want to see how they're going to engage and what their, what their frame of mind is. If it's very clear that they're standoffish and they're not going to engage, I use that one question and a throwaway yes, no question that can be answered in 10 seconds. And then I say, thank you, you've answered everything I need. And I actually cut the interview off. I figure don't waste their time because it's just going to upset them. But also, I don't want to waste my own time. And that's why I said 10 minutes. And I, I say, I want to be respectful of your time. I told you it'd be less than 10 minutes and it's less than 10 minutes and we cut it off. That way I can use that warm up question or a framing question to understand, are they engaged? Are they the right person to be talking to? Are they going to be responsive? And if that feels like it's good, then I use that to lead into the more or frame the topic that I do care about. Um, and I'll give you one quick example. I see we're right, or we're a couple minutes over. Um, I'll point to um, Ryan Shelton at Photonicare, which is a company that's been through Research Park and a lot of these programs. He learned early on that he had to have his Goldilocks question. They were looking at middle ear infections um, in uh, pediatrics. And so they would call pediatricians and first they were saying, what are the three biggest, um, or I'm sorry, what are the biggest issues you face in your practice? And they get things like billing and HR and way off their topic. And then when they go in and talk about middle ear infection, how do you diagnose middle ear infection? And is it accurate? The question became all about their technology. So they learned that they could go in and say, what are the three most common diagnoses you see in your practice? And they knew they'd get common cold, they knew they'd get middle ear infection, and they knew they'd get vaccinations. They knew those were the three answers. And that gave them the opportunity to gauge the person with a warm-up question, 
And then to say, okay, can we talk about, you, you mentioned middle ear infection. Can we talk more about how you do that? So they would frame that conversation and then go in. So they did a really nice job of setting that up. So hopefully that helps you um, think about how to, how to address individuals. All right, um, I know uh, we're at time. Um, we're over time. I've gone a couple minutes over. Um, I will say thank you for taking the time. I'm happy to schedule time if anybody wants additional help and look forward to the fall cohorts that we will be kicking off um, beginning early September and early October. Um, Kathy, is there anything else that you need to do to wrap? Uh, no, thank you, Harley. I mentioned in the chat, we will send out a recording link to today's workshop. Um, as soon as I get that notification from Zoom, I'll get that out to everyone who registered today. And thank you again, everyone who attended. Yeah, I appreciate your time. Take care.